What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today I'm bringing you something that I am actually really, really excited to do. Something that I've been meaning to work on for the last several months and just haven't gotten around to until now. And that is a cold IPA. Now a lot of you guys are wondering what the hell is a cold IPA and why isn't it an IPL? For the longest time, I honestly thought cold IPA was a stupid rebranding of IPL, which is a thing that's been in existence for a long time, India Pale Lager. Um, essentially, the concept of it is you take a West Coast IPA, you replace the ale yeast with lager yeast, and you're good to go. Now, a cold IPA is actually quite different from that, and after doing a lot of research on the style, I realized that it is indeed significantly different. A cold IPA, as it is defined nowadays, is really a lot more like an India Pale Kolsch or an India Pale adjunct lager, just dialed up to like 7% or so, the typical strength of a West Coast IPA. You're taking a uh, beer style, basically, that has a very, very light malt contribution and then throwing an absolute ridiculous amount of hops at it, West Coast style, so you get that high bitterness, you get that very, very aggressive hop character, and then you ferment it with lager yeast. So basically you have the malt getting out of the way, you have the yeast getting out of the way, and then really all that's left is just a lot of hop character. It's got nothing to hide behind, and it is really put on display in a very interesting way. So that's why it's a very different thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the style of an adjunct lager, but really you want something that's very pale, you want something that has a very low malt contribution, low malt complexity, very, very light color, um, and fermented with a yeast that is extremely clean. I did a lot of research on this style, but ultimately I decided to actually take a recipe off of the internet that's tried and true and make it make sense for our systems here and then make it a little bit easier, I think, for everybody else. So what we're doing today is actually almost exactly the recipe to the original cold IP from Wayfinder Brewing. Um, this is the beer that started it all, and the recipe's actually been made public uh, courtesy of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine and Pints and Panels. The one thing I'm doing differently here, though, is making this recipe a little bit more easy to brew, and we'll see how it turns out in the final product. At the end of the day, the beer that I'm looking to create here is a highly drinkable, very dry finishing, uh, roughly 6 to 8% ABV beer um, that has a ridiculous amount of West Coast hop character in it. High bitterness and a high amount of hop flavor. It really is a showcase of hopping, I think, at different levels in the process. We're hopping in the boil, we're doing a whirlpool, and we're doing a dry hop. Um, so all of these things should contribute some flavor to the final beer that we should be able to identify and pick out at the very end. There should be enough malt to stand on for the hops, but really nothing more. You don't want additional malt flavor in this. Um, it really should be focusing uh, entirely on the hops. We don't want esters, we don't want sulfur character, we want this to be very clean. So that's what I'm targeting. I want to give a big shout out to Northern Brewer for providing the ingredients for this batch of beer and also to Clout Hammer Supply for the system that I'll be brewing this on today. We'll be using the 10 gallon 240 volt brewing system. And of course, a big shout out to Pints and Panels. Follow their Instagram account if you haven't already. Uh, it's a great uh, breakdown of different kinds of beer styles and a very easy way to uh, interpret them. Um, and also just thanks for that recipe, of course, to Wayfinder Brewing and Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Acknowledgements are out of the way. Let's jump into the recipe. So to start out, I'm going to be using a high quality Pilsner malt. We're going to be going with Mecca Grade Pelton Pilsner Malt. I've really been into Mecca Grade malts as of late. Their base malts are phenomenal, um, albeit a bit more expensive than uh, you typically would pay for something like uh, Brees or Rar malt. I have not used their Pilsner malt yet, so I'm excited to see how that performs. As this is modeled basically after a uh, Imperial adjunct lager, um, I'm going to be adding in two pounds of flaked rice. Flaked rice typically gives a little bit of a puffiness to the mouthfeel. It also lightens the color of the beer significantly and then also creates um, a little bit, I think, of a snappiness in the character of the, uh, the finished product. I've only ever used it in light lagers before. I've never used it in anything over 5% ABV, so this should be very interesting to see what it does. And then lastly, of course, we want to dry this out and get it to finish at a very low gravity while still having a relatively high ABV. And the secret ingredient there is one pound of dextrose uh, to get us down to a lower than 1010 final gravity and hopefully a higher than 7% ABV. Hey guys, Steve from the future here on actual brew day with a slight update for you. Um, so when I actually initially filmed the recipe section for this video, I totally forgot that I was using cryo hops uh, in some of the parts of this recipe. And so therefore I called out the wrong alpha acids. I called out the wrong uh, amounts as well. So this is just going to be an update to the hop section of the video. In this particular style, we're targeting a bitterness unit to gravity unit ratio slightly over one. So this is going to be a relatively bitter beer overall. 
Um, and the bulk of that bitterness is gonna come from our bittering addition at 60 minutes. Now in the recipe that's provided by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine and Pints and Panels, uh, it actually implies to use hop extract in combination with pelletized magnum hops uh, to achieve about 45 IBUs. I'm not gonna be doing that, I'm just gonna stick with traditional uh, single uh, pelletized magnum for this one to get 45 IBUs. My magnum is 16.1% alpha acid, and so I'm adding in three quarters of an ounce at 60 minutes. And then no other hops are going into the boil uh, until the very end of the boil, in which case we're adding about a third of an ounce each of Centennial Cryo and Mosaic Cryo. And I'm adding these Cryo hops because I think they're gonna add a lot of extra punch and flavor, um, and it's a really efficient way to use hops. And then at the very end of the boil, we'll knock out and we'll go down to a whirlpool where we recirculate the hops around the kettle uh, at a lower temperature of about 180 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes. And then for that particular addition, we'll be adding in uh, two thirds of an ounce each of Centennial Cryo and Mosaic Cryo. And we're gonna get a lot of bitterness from this addition as well, so we've gotta keep that in mind. The overall IBUs are coming out somewhere around 71, I think. And of course, dry hopping is a very important part of this recipe as well. Um, so the recipe calls for two and a half ounces each of Amarillo, Cascade, and Chinook going into the dry hop basically at the tail end of fermentation. Now, uh, I'm actually using cryo versions of both Amarillo and Cascade, and so I'll be adding in only an ounce and a quarter of those and two and a half ounces of Chinook, which is the non-cryo version. And uh, the reason for that is just because cryo can generally be assumed to be about double the uh, potency of a traditional pelletized hop. And these are gonna sit in the beer at a cold temperature for about four days. The idea behind this cold temperature is not only to prevent hop creep, which will that can happen very easily if you're dry hopping during uh, active fermentation, but also a lot of emerging research. There's a real shift moving now towards dry hopping for short contact time at colder temperatures of about 60 Fahrenheit in a soft crash. Um, and having done that already with a phenomenal New England IPA that I brewed earlier this year, I can confirm it produces some phenomenal flavors. So you wanna dry hop basically at a colder temperature for a short period of time to get some really pleasant extraction with minimal grassy off flavors. Yes, I know also that uh, the amount of dry hops in this recipe is exceeding the shell hammer limit of approximately one ounce per gallon of dry hops. To avoid issues from exceeding the shell hammer limit, we basically want to dry hop um, basically between two and four days of overall contact time before dropping the hops and yeast out and continuing to condition for another week or so. For the water on this guy, we are going with classic West Coast, a high sulfate to chloride ratio to really bring out the bitterness, the snappiness, the crispness of these hops, and then also to really uh, accentuate a dry finish on this beer. So that water profile is gonna be 99 parts per million of calcium, also high calcium because we wanna uh, drop clear and calcium will help the yeast drop out. 10 parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 168 parts per million of sulfates, and zero parts per million of bicarbonates. In order to get that water profile, I'll be using seven grams of gypsum, three grams of epsom, and five grams of calcium chloride, adding all of that to my mash water, which is gonna be eight gallons of spring water. Um, using spring water because it is easily accessible, large jugs, less stuff to throw away or recycle, and um, basically, it's gonna be negligible levels of uh, any mineral when we're building up to a water profile that's this high. Uh, you really don't see, especially with Poland spring water, which is what I like to use, you don't see high levels of any mineral really beyond uh, five to 10 parts per million. So that's not something I really tend to worry about as it's not gonna influence the final beer really all that much at all. For the yeast on this one, you want to use a hybrid yeast of some kind, something that is either going to be a lager yeast that can ferment at higher temperatures or an ale yeast that is very, very clean and can ferment at a lower temperature. Um, the choice of yeast for me today is going to be Saf Lager W3470. Because of the high gravity on this one, we're gonna be going for two packets of that going into the wort. Um, we're gonna ferment this at 65 Fahrenheit, which is about the upper range of the spectrum for it. It should be a very fast fermentation and it really should get the job done quickly. For the mash on this one, it is a two-step mash. Again, I'm simplifying the recipe that was given by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. No cereal mash here, but we are sticking with the step mash because we want to maximize fermentability. So we're gonna go with a 45 minute rest at 140 Fahrenheit, followed up by a 
45 minute rest at 158 Fahrenheit. Now, if you don't have the ability to step mash, I would recommend sticking with a single infusion temperature of 148 Fahrenheit and holding that rest for a really long time because you really want to guarantee that all the conversion that can take place does take place because you really want the spirit to be as dry and as crisp as a finishing uh, gravity as possible. So I'm really, really excited to get this brewing. Um, it is going to be the perfect beer, I think, for this hot weather. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let's jump into the brew day. I started out by adding eight gallons of water into my 10 gallon, 240 volt claw hammer supply system, and it started to heat that up to that first mash rest temperature of 140 Fahrenheit. While this was going on, I measured out all my grain and milled it, and also measured out my water salts and added those to the strike water as it was heating up. Once the water reached that mash in temperature, I went ahead and dowed in with the entire grist, being sure to break up any clumps and stuff like that uh, that formed as a result of doughing in. About 10 minutes into the mash, I pulled a sample for a pH measurement and found it to be uh, pleasantly on target at about 5.3 to 5.4, so that was good to see. I did not need to make any sort of pH adjustments to my wort and let it continue for the remainder of the 45 minutes of this step at 140 Fahrenheit. So I stepped it up to the next rest temperature of 158 Fahrenheit for 45 more minutes. Once that 45 minutes of uh, the second step had elapsed, I started to raise it up to 170 Fahrenheit for a mash out and then I pulled out the grain basket after letting it rest at 170 for 15 minutes. I let the grain basket drain for another 15 minutes, but at this time I also raised the temperature of the wort up to a near boil and just held it there slightly below a boil to avoid a boil over. Once the basket had finished draining, I went ahead and I carried on to a full boil, adding in my bittering addition, which was three quarters of an ounce of magnum. About 50 minutes into this boil, I added uh, finding agents in the form of whirl flock, and I also added some yeast nutrient at this time. I also added my one pound of dextrose. I also added my 50 minute hop addition at this time, which was a third of an ounce each of cryo centennial and cryo mosaic. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and I started to cool it down slightly until I reached my uh, target whirlpool temperature of 180 Fahrenheit. And then at that point, I started a whirlpool and let it sit at 180 for 20 minutes with two thirds of an ounce each of cryo centennial and cryo mosaic in the whirlpool. Once the whirlpool was complete, I continued the chill down to pitching temperatures. I transferred all the wort into my Brewbuilt X2, and I took an OG reading at this time. I found it to be 1057, which was about three points short of the intended target gravity 1060. Nonetheless, I pitched in my two packets of Saflager W3470 once I reached that pitch temperature of 65 and left it to ferment. So for fermentation on this beer, what I'm choosing to do is use Saflager W3470, pitching two packets of that in, fermenting it at about 65 Fahrenheit. This is going to be a very fast fermentation. Uh, 3470 is perfectly capable of fermenting cleanly at that high temperature without sulfur and without additional esters. Um, it's really remarkable yeast. And because of that, it's the perfect yeast for this particular style. Cold IPA brewing does seem to be very adamant on doing a dry hop before the end of fermentation. So um, basically you wanna keep an eye on your fermentation, maybe four or five days in, uh, it might actually be completely fermented. So just try to keep an eye on it and try to get those dry hops in around day four or five, right at the tail end of fermentation. Leave them in there for two to four days at about 60 to 65 Fahrenheit, and you should have a really good dry hop character. Once I see a gravity somewhere around 10, 12, I will go ahead and add my dry hops into the fermenter. I will ensure that they sit in there for about two to four days, 60 to 65 Fahrenheit, really. Once I confirm that those are finished, I'll cold crash that beer down to about 35 Fahrenheit or so, let it sit there for a week or so, drop the hops and the yeast out once they've uh, collected at the bottom of the cone and we'll be uh, good to go pretty much at that point. I'll probably also spun this beer using a spunding valve set to about 15 PSI, add that in after I uh, add my dry hops and probably have this uh, pouring relatively quickly, maybe about a week after we actually do the dry hopping. Uh, so that'll be nice. 
Of course, if you don't have a conical, the way I recommend dry hopping this one is using a magnet technique, using a sous vide magnet uh, with a dry hop bag that you suspend inside of your fermenter over the wort with uh, another magnet or two on the outside of the fermenter to hold it in place. Once you know when you're gonna dry hop, just release that outer set of magnets and drop the uh, bag of hops into the beer. It should do the trick for you. I will pre-acidify my wort before I pitch in my yeast to bring it down to about 5.1. Uh, and the reason for this is because when you add those dry hops, you're actually raising the pH of the beer significantly, which can have profound effects on the flavor and the presentation of these dry hops when they come through later. Now, if you're brewing with Kvike, you'll actually see that pH drop in the beer at the very end anyway. And this is beneficial because then when you add those dry hops, it'll raise the pH back up, but it's actually gonna end up right about where it needs to be. So Kvike, especially Lutra, is a fantastic option for this particular type of beer. And that's kind of a good segue into alternative yeasts besides W3470. Um, I would recommend, secondly, Nova Lager, which is another great high-performing uh, hybrid lager yeast. You can ferment that up to about 65 to 68 Fahrenheit. Again, it actually produces very, very low levels of sulfur as well, which is beneficial for this particular beer style. This beer style really is not limited to just lager yeasts, though. You can use a clean fermenting ale yeast like US05, the Chico strain, and get that down to about 62 to 65, and it'll ferment very, very clean. It'll also attenuate very, very far. It's a very useful yeast for this particular thing. Also consider a German ale strain, like a Kolsch yeast or an Alt yeast. Um, these are also very much capable of doing the same thing, but you can also get away with using a uh, high temperature American lager strain, like the Cal Common yeast. At the end of the day, you want a yeast that is going to deliver a very clean finish and not have really any esters um, or other contributions to the flavor, but still be able to ferment at a relatively high temperature. Of course, this is also a phenomenal beer to pressure ferment if you have the ability to do so. It's a lager yeast, and lagers are really the ideal beer to do this with. So if you can't get yourself down to 65, um, I would recommend doing a little bit of a pressure fermentation on this one. Again, I'd stick with 3470 or, um, or maybe another type of clean lager yeast that you can play around with with pressure. S189 is a good option as well for that. So anyway, I'm very excited to see how this beer turns out. I will catch you guys in a few weeks after it's all ready. So until then, cheers. So for the fermentation on the cold IPA, it was incredibly fast, which is actually to be expected from using Saf Lager W3470 at a high temperature like this. So I reached my final gravity in a mere four days of fermentation. However, on that third day, I saw that the final gravity was near, but not totally achieved yet. So I added in my dry hops at this time. At this point, I let it sit in the beer as it reached its final gravity, and for a total of about 48 hours at about 60 Fahrenheit. Even though the beer was sitting at 60 Fahrenheit, it continued to ferment all the way down to 10.03. That's an absurd level of attenuation, but not uncommon for this particular style of beer. As soon as the 48 hour dry hop was completed, I cold crashed the beer, and then I transferred it into a keg and let it condition at lager temperatures for another week or two before putting it on tap, and uh, I was quite pleasantly surprised with the way it turned out. So the beer is called Chill Out, and it comes in at 7.2% ABV and 71 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it is a beautiful uh, light pale gold color, uh, maybe a little bit verging on straw, but not quite. It's totally clear. There's definitely some condensation on the glass, but you can see right through it. Um, and it's a really nice visual effect seeing all the bubbles coming up through the beer. Uh, it pours with a really pretty good uh, overall white head that sticks around for a, a period of time, but quickly falls and leaves a layer on the surface. That being said, there is still some pretty good lacing overall. This beer, however, looks exactly how you might expect it to drink. It's extremely drinkable and very refreshing, especially on a hot day like today. All right, so let's go in for aroma. Very aromatic beer, first of all. Um, nothing but hops on the aroma. Straight up citrus and resin character. It smells very West Coast. Um, it's got that kind of uh, slight dank edge to it. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. Mm. 
Um, it's actually not as dry as I thought it was going to feel. Despite being 1003 final gravity, like absurdly dry, it does not seem like a Saison at all. It's got 7.2% ABV, and I think that that, in combination with the hop oils, um, really do actually add a lot of body to this beer. It feels more like a medium-bodied beer, um, although it's not nearly as full-bodied as a West Coast IPA traditionally is, you know, with all that extra sugar and those extra caramel malts in there, this is lacking that and um, actually has a really nice, highly drinkable, enjoyable character. It really does make for a very crushable, very drinkable beer, and at 7.2%, I would never have guessed that. Carbonation level on this one is uh, standard two and a half volumes. It's a standard American ale carbonation level, and I think that's quite appropriate for this style. Um, there's no reason to do anything otherwise. I think if I had accentuated the dryness by adding a lot more carbonation to this, it would have come out a little bit drier, um, but that would have taken away from the character of the hops, I think. And I think the most interesting aspect of the mouthfeel experience here too is that this is indeed a lager, and it drinks like a lager. It's got a nice crisp edge to it, it's got a very nice, satisfying drinkability, and um, all that, I think, is coming from that lager yeast. It's also just a tremendously flavorful beer and a fantastic interpretation of West Coast hops. So let's go in for that amazing flavor right now. So the hops here are really front and center, um, and that's the way that this is really supposed to be. I mean, the whole concept behind a cold IPA is that everything but the hops kind of gets out of the way, and we showcase some really nice West Coast hops. And that's exactly how this is coming across right now. We've got a really nice, decent level of bitterness. Not as much, I think, as I had anticipated I would get, though. But there is a huge amount of hop flavor in this beer. Just absolutely insane amount of hop flavor. It's just a ton of West Coast classic hops. You get tons of orange, tangerine, and a lot of resin. Very nice kind of piney note. It's a little kind of characteristic of dankness in the background, um, but honestly, not too much. Yeah, it's kind of like a little bit of a, a berry note in there, some strawberry, maybe a little blueberry, um, but really the dominating characteristics are classic citrus, like, um, like orange, tangerine kind of citrus, uh, and then also you're just getting a lot of that resin character to back everything up. It's really, really quite a nice hop profile, and um, yeah, I'm really, really happy with the way that turned out. And then at the very end of everything, we're kind of getting a little bit of a mild maltiness. Um, nothing really beyond your classic kind of basic, cereally white bread character of a basic two-row or Pilsner malt. Now, I'm not getting the rice puffiness or anything like that. Uh, just plain old Pilsner character, just a background hint of it, um, but it all comes after the hops. So the hops are really everything that this beer is about, and then you get a little nice bit of maltiness at the very end. It's an extremely drinkable beer, it's extremely refreshing, and it actually just begs you to take another sip every single time. This is a 16 ounce glass, and it might be the fastest I've actually consumed one of these 7% beers uh, during a tasting note. Uh, session like this. This beer is so drinkable that I'm gonna have to finish this one and go back for more. Usually when I'm filming these segments, I have to pour two beers. One for the thumbnail and the, you know, kind of showcase profile shots and one for the actual tasting. And um, this is <laughs> the <laughs> warmed up thumbnail version. It's definitely a bit more light struck than the other one, but that's all right. So like your classic old school West Coast IPA had a little bit more caramel malt in it. Typically, there is a, a design in there to strike a balance between kind of sweeter caramel notes and a lot of those aggressive West Coast hops. They were typically amber or very dark gold color beers, and they had a prominent note of caramel malts. And now that's changed quite a bit, and the industry has kind of moved away from using caramel malts in, in hoppy beers. Nowadays, more of the West Coast IPAs are kind of leading towards this direction. Very light malt character, very strong in the hops. And I think that's what really spurred on the idea of this cold IPA is like, how much further can you go uh, in terms of getting the other ingredients out of the way and just leaving hops behind? And this is, this is a really interesting thing. And that's where the difference between cold IPA and IPL really comes through the most, I think, is that IPL is subscribing to that old school West Coast IPA mentality. I've made one before on the channel a long time ago. Essentially, all it is is a traditional West Coast IPA with that caramel malt inclusion. Um, made with lager yeast instead of an ale. <laughs> this is an entirely different creation than an IPL. At the end of the day, it's a lot simpler and it is simply just a showcase of hops. There is nothing else involved here. There's clean as a whistle as far as yeast goes. 
very little malt contribution and just a powerhouse of American West Coast style hops. Um, it's a phenomenal beer, actually. And I'm really very happy that I brewed this style. And as far as potential improvements for this beer go, um, the only one I can really highlight is that I personally think I would like a lot more bitterness in this. It's actually a relatively potent beer on paper in terms of bitterness at 71 IBUs. Um, and at 1057 OG, the IBU to OG ratio is actually over 1.0, which indicates a relatively bitter beer. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm actually wanting more bitterness in this, or at least a different kind of bitterness. A sharp, snappy bitterness that I really associate with West Coast IPAs. That's really, honestly, the only contribution that I would change, though. Um, at the end of the day, the grist is, is not supposed to be complicated, so I wouldn't add anything to that or take it away. I wouldn't change the gravity. It's a uh, very standard IPA strength level. I don't think there's a need to make this into a stronger version of itself or a lighter version of itself. Um, although you could dial back the OG and turn this into a West Coast Pilsner. Um, that's another option as well, a very similar style of beer as well. The uh, final thing I think I want to touch on here, this is the first time I've actually pre-acidified my wort prior to pitching my yeast. Um, and that made a phenomenal difference in the expression of the hop character coming through here. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. This is a really cool beer, really interesting style and something that's absolutely hitting the spot this time of year. It's satisfying my desire for hops in a perfect way right now. Um, and I wouldn't change really that much about it other than that bitterness. And guys, if you learned something and you enjoy the video, please hit that like button before you go. It means the world to me because it makes my videos a lot more visible to the rest of YouTube. And that is very important right now. Please also subscribe if you haven't already and comment down below with your thoughts on cold IPA versus IPL. I know that's going to be a debate, but also if you've made something like this, please let me know. What are your thoughts on the whole process? The best thing about this community is that we all talk. We all make each other a little bit smarter at the end of the day. So check out the comments section if you haven't already and you're watching this video. You might learn something. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find that in my merchandise store down below in the description box, along with many other different designs as well. If you want to contribute to the channel in a different way, there's also a Patreon. And my Patreon supporters have made massive massive differences for this channel in terms of production quality and many other things so i really really do appreciate the patreon support at the end of the day there's also channel memberships and the super thanks button if you want to hit either of those things that, that really does help me out quite a bit and there's an amazon store where you can find all of the brewing equipment that's on amazon that i personally recommend as well as my production equipment my cameras my audio all that stuff if you want to follow me on more than just youtube i'm also active on instagram and facebook as the apartment brewer and you'll see uh, a lot more frequent content on those platforms forums i do tend to try and supplement when i'm not uploading to youtube with content on instagram and facebook you'll get to see what's going to come to the channel eventually you'll get to see brew days all that stuff so do check it out if you've got some time and last but certainly not least if you are still here and you're still watching all the way to the end of the video i seriously appreciate you watching the entire video that means so much to me because i put so much work into these things it takes me a really long time to make these videos and i appreciate when people watch the whole thing i sincerely hope you guys are learning something and getting something out of these videos because that's why i make them i want to help you guys increase your brewing skills and make better beer for yourselves and also to explore new and interesting styles like this one so please if you enjoyed it let me know so this one goes out to you guys and uh, yeah, until the next one, cheers. Uh -huh.